Television Network. Somali President Mohamed Farmajo is in Burundi ahead of a planned withdrawal of Burundian troops from Somalia. Presidential candidates in Nigeria hit the campaign trail again after polls rescheduled for February the 23rd. And an explosion in the Egyptian capital kills two policemen in pursuit of a militant. Hello and welcome to CGTN. This is Africa Live and I'm Karen Roberts in Nairobi, also coming up in the programme. In business, Tanzania loses $96.6 million a year due to drought. And how a music festival in Eastern DRC is helping to drive the peace agenda in the country. We begin the bulletin in Burundi, where the country's president, Pierre Nkurunziza, is hosting his Somali counterpart, Mohamed Formaggio. The Somali president visits to the East African nation, comes amid disquiet by Burundi on plans to withdraw its 1,000 troops from Somalia. Well, Burundi is one of the African nations that contributes to the United Nations and African Union-funded peacekeeping mission in Somalia. Burundian soldiers are expected to leave Somalia by the end of this month, despite calls by local authorities on the security implications to the region. Somalia has warned against a rushed withdrawal plan, insisting that it could leave the state vulnerable to attacks. Well, we can now go live to Giram Chala, who is in Addis Ababa for us. Um, Giram, why is the African Union pushing ahead with this planned withdrawal of Amazon troops from Somalia, despite the prevailing threat from al-Shabaab militants? So the African Union military mission in Somalia, Amazon, was there at the beginning to calm situations down, to also support the constitutionally backed, UN-backed, African Union-backed government in the country. As you know, over the last uh, many years, since 2007, AMISOM has done a lot of job of uh, perhaps flashing out Al-Shabaab from different strongholds it had uh, been holding uh, across Somalia. But now the African Union feels like we can no more be in the country forever. The Somalia forces uh, need to take over the security situation of the country. Somalia needs to also build institutions to become uh, a fully controlling uh, nation of its own internal issues, including peace and security in the country. So that is why, despite, as you've said, despite the warring security situation, uh, bomb blast here and there, the African Union still is pushing the uh, continuous uh, withdrawal of its troops uh, from Somalia. But it's understandable that the situation is still fragile in the AU, uh, despite uh, its pushing uh, withdrawal from that country. OK, thank you, Guram. We, we will return to you in a moment. We now have Abdulaziz Bilo with us. He is in Mogadishu. Um, Abdulaziz, what is the significance of the visit to Burundi by the Somali president? Well, current experts here have analyzed the President Formaggio's visit to Burundi, which is, the f is his first as a sitting Somali president in two ways. One is to acknowledge uh, the role played by the Burundi National Defense Force uh, that was uh, the second uh, uh, troop contributing country to join the multinational peacekeeping force known as uh, Army Summit. came here in 2007, just the time when uh, militant group Al-Shabaab was about to pick up and uh, increase more attacks against the Somali uh, government. So the visit was just to acknowledge Burundi for paying the ultimate sacrifice in the liberation of Mogadishu and also in uh, liberating a vast territory in uh, South and Central uh, Somalia. And the second uh, reason, as the experts here are saying, was the visit uh, prompted by President Farmajo is uh, because the African Union is doing a, a drawdown of its troops and 1,000 
troops from Burundi are due to exit Somalia by end of this month, exactly on the 28th. So it served two purposes. One was to acknowledge uh, the role played by Burundi and one to tell Pierre Kurunzinza, the president of Burundi, that eventually all African Union peacekeeping forces will have to exit the country and hand over security to Somali forces. It was, it was just a reassurance that this was not an it's not singling out Burundi, but then again, it's a general issue that was discussed by African Union and one that Somalia is on board with. And uh, Abdulaziz, why is Burundi reluctant to withdraw its troops from Somalia? Well, since uh, the announcement in 2018 that Burundi will have to uh, withdraw 1,000 troops from Somalia, that issue elicited mixed uh, reactions in Burundi. Authorities there were saying that they are being singled out uh, uh, and uh, they are told to remove their forces, and it was not proportionate. They, what uh, Burundi insisted on is that uh, since it's 1,000 forces that need to exit as per the United Nations Security Council resolution, they wanted, since there are five countries participating in AMISOM, equal number of troops to be removed from all peacekeeping uh, countries and troop contributing countries. So it, does, it saw that it was being singled out and more so it didn't see this as an issue that is being advocated by Somalia or the African Union. It thought that it's uh, an issue that is being pushed, an agenda that's being pushed rather by the European uh, Union that was not in good terms with, uh, with Burundi. So uh, Burundi on the other end play a pivotal role in security here in Somalia. They are in charge of Sector 5, that is uh, the middle Shabelle region on the uh, outskirts of Mogadishu and also parts of Mogadishu. So uh, they are vital in securing uh, the capital city from threats from militant group Al-Shabaab. And also Somali authorities did express their concerns about that uh, vi vacuum that will be created after the exit of 1,000 forces from uh, Burundi. So all in all, Somalia says that uh, exit strategy by Amazon will have to take place but then again, the vacuum there must be protected so that Al-Shabaab does not re-emerge and create chaos again in the country. Okay, thank you very much, Abdulaziz. Now let's return to Giram Chala, who is in Addis Ababa in Ethiopia for us. Um, is Burundi likely to have its request to have its troops remain in Burundi honored? Out of the more than 21,000 uh, Amazon troops on the ground, Burundi is the second largest contributor uh, of troops uh, with uh, f more than 5,400 uh, troops on the ground, which is uh, only uh, the higher number that is, uh, is Ugandan troops at the moment. Now, B Burundi's request at the moment has uh, multifaceted uh, needs behind it. First, as Abdulaziz was saying, Burundi is the most important um, player when it comes to you know pacifying uh, the Mogadishu area uh, on its uh, sector a uh, second however is you know the troops are paid by the European Union and the African Union pays troop contribution countries for their contributions and uh, reports suggest that about 18 million dollars is uh, paid per year for Burundi and that's a major significant amount of money for Burundi for a country that is suffering uh, from lack of uh, aid from international community so the request has been submitted for the African Union, but we hear that it's only the Peace and Security Council that should decide, and we shall see if that's going to be the case for Burundi's request. Okay, thank you very much. That was Guram Chala there in Addis Ababa. And earlier, of course, we spoke to Abdulaziz Bilo in Mogadishu. Well, now let's cross over to Nigeria, where CGTN's Richard Antar is part of the team covering the upcoming elections there. Richard, over to you. A very good morning to you, Karen, and to our viewers across the continent and around the globe. We thank you for joining CGTN's continued coverage of Nigeria's elections. Well, the word is out. The Nigeria's Independent Electoral Commission has given permission to political parties to resume campaigning up till 24 hours until the rescheduled date. As a matter of fact, political parties threatened to sue INEC if it did not extend the campaign period. Billy Haza has more on that story. 
INEC National Commissioner for Information and Voter Education, Festus Sukoye, says political parties and candidates can resume campaign activities until the end of Thursday. Most political parties, including ruling All Progressives Congress, APC, and main opposition People's Democratic Party, PDP, had insisted they were going ahead with campaigning with or without a commission's approval. The parties who threatened court action against INEC argued that the electoral body did not have the right to stop them from campaigning several days before the election, as the Electoral Act states that campaigns stop 24 hours to the D-Day. Nadra's 2019 elections were postponed by a week just hours before the start of the process on Saturday due to logistics and operational challenges faced by INEC. These additional days of campaigns will see both parties try to remind the electorate of their manifestos as well as who others who may not have decided on which candidates to cast their ballots for. It's a tough contest between APC's incumbent President Muhammad Buhari, who is seeking to rule the country for a second term, and the former Vice President Atikwa Bubukar of the PDP. The presidential elections now take place on February 23rd, while the gubernatorial polls will take place on March 9th. Phil Ihaza, CGTN Abuja, Nigeria. Well, the leading political parties have started accusing each other of colluding with the Electoral Commission to rig the elections. The elections were scheduled um, initially, postponed rather, to the 23rd of uh, February. The Electoral Commission itself has blamed poor weather conditions. Can you believe it? And of course, uh, sabotage for its reasoning for postponing the elections. Kelechi Mekalam, our correspondent, has more on that story. Let's go to it. I can put my hand on the Holy Quran that INEC leadership shared, knew that they were going to postpone the election. They shared this information with the People's Democratic Party and advised them not to waste their resources. Why pretend to us that they are on top of the situation? A major fallout between Nigeria's ruling All Progressives Congress and the Electoral Commission days after the commission suspended elections. The ruling party disputes the reasons for the postponement and wants the commission investigated. More than 90 political parties are participating in Saturday's elections, seen as a horse race between the ruling APC and the opposition PDP. Both parties are questioning the impartiality of the electoral commission. Multiple intelligence sources available to us in PDP shows that all progressive Congress, APC, in conjunction with the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, through their ICT situation room, have con concluded the plans to manipulate the outcome of Saturday's election. The commission denies any wrongdoing, but clearly it has more to do than just fixing the problems that it said made it impossible to hold the elections as scheduled. It also has to win the confidence of the front runners. One of them will carry the day, while the other would need to accept defeat at the end of elections. Kelechi Emekalam, CGTN Abuja, Nigeria. All right, let's go to our political analyst, George Amonia, who is standing by for more information. George, thank you for joining us here on CGTN Africa Live. Is the extension of the campaign of any significance, and is it likely, in your opinion, to influence voters? Uh, yes? Is it talking? George, you, I, I, I is didn't get the extension you. You of the opinion, campaign what? period of any significance is it likely to influence voter turnout? I, of course, it, uh, it is uh, significant because uh, people have traveled home to, to vote and some of them had to come back to their places of uh, businesses and work and uh, most of them may not go back to vote again. You know, so it, uh, it, it, it will affect uh, some people and some of them will be disenfranchised, yes. Break it down for us, George. What is the ramifications of the extended campaign period? Uh, I, the, I, I'm not sure the, the, the campaign will change much. A lot of people have made up their minds who, on who to vote for months ago. But we, we still have some uh, 
couple of people who are undecided, who I think uh, maybe the campaign, this uh, campaign that has been extended, will uh, influence their decisions. Well, George Einek is expected to call media for a briefing on his preparations this afternoon. As an analyst, what do you expect to hear from INEC? I, I don't think INEC have much to say for now. They've said everything uh, after the cancellation. The INEC chairman addressed Nigerians and has told everybody the problem. What they're going to say now is not going to help or uh, they're not going to say anything new to Nigerians. You know? People are expecting them now to conduct a free and fair and credible election. But for now, I don't think INEC have much to say or if anything they say will be new. Georgia Monia, thank you for that update and report. We shall be talking to you again really, really soon. All right, moving on. It, it's been a really hectic week for uh, media agencies, not only in Nigeria, but all across the world. As you know, the elections were derailed media in general have been criticized for its objectivity or lack of it but nonetheless the media has made incredible strides in the last few years we have robert nagila with a story you don't want to miss good evening welcome to the program azubike osumele is the host of one of the most popular political radio shows in lagos all our politics I started on the 3rd of September. Developed to tackle political issues around the 2019 Nigerian elections, it is energetic, fast-paced, and interactive. Those comments are not good for our democracy. This same country we've carried fake news and other things all over the social media. His guest tonight is a ruling party spokesman. Tomorrow, we'll get somebody from the other side. A journalist for over 20 years, Azubike is clear why his show has a huge following. Because I understand that fairness, balance, objectivity is the soul of journalism. But he also admits not everyone in the industry is objective. Largely, Nigerian media tends to uh, be divided along partisan lines, especially because of ownership. You know, when, when you check the ownership of the, it's not just radio or television, even the newspapers. Uh, most of the owners of the newspapers are political party members. The Nigerian media industry is a crowded field. There are literally hundreds of radio stations, TV networks and newspapers. Inevitably, the question of objectivity during election coverage is never far behind. Veteran journalist Lekun Otifodunrin is a media trainer who's been involved in training journalists on how to cover the elections. One of the issues tackled is objectivity. One of the things we are doing during the training is talk about ethics. There are ethics that have been done and people need to abide by the ethics. The ethics is that you need to ensure that you are not partisan. You need to be very fair. But in this crowded space, how does one ensure that the public is getting balanced and objective information? One of the things I like about Nigerian media is that there is a balance of forces. So for every media that is owned by another one politician, that's another one owned by another politician. And there are enough independent media houses that can ensure that we're on track. The training he provides also includes how to spot fake news, a major issue in these elections. But so far, he believes the media is on the right track. And with citizen journalism on the rise, they cannot afford to sleep up. Robert Magila, CGTN, Lagos, Nigeria. All right, for the team, I'm Richard Searle and Taz saying thank you so much for watching. We have enjoyed this interaction immensely, and we will be right back here at 17 GMT for more coverage of Nigeria's elections. Right back to you, Karen, in studio. Okay, thank you very much, Richard. Richard there in Abuja following the election period in Nigeria for us. Moving on, Senegal is often described as the most stable democracy in West Africa. In Sunday's election, incumbent President Macky Sall will face four other candidates seeking to unseat him. Sall is widely expected to win a second term after the country's two best-known opposition figures were barred from running due to corruption allegations. <laughs> With the election just days away, the five presidential candidates are making a final push to win over more supporters. 
I renew my commitment so that the second mandate from 2019 to 2024, your city will be among some of the most beautiful cities in Senegal, and I commit myself to working together with you. Macky Sall, 57, started in politics as a member of former president and mentor Abdullahi Wadi's Senegalese Democratic Party. He was Prime Minister of Senegal from April 2004 to June 2007 during Wadi's reign. However, internal disputes led Sal to split with Wadi in 2008 and form his own party under which he has led Senegal since 2012. The arrival of the motorway, which will go as far as Kaulak, as well as upcoming arrival of an open digital hub and the new center, a very big center for professional training. Because here, there will be a network of dedicated tourism and hotels, a maritime network for fisheries, and there will be also other networks such as agriculture, side by side with the community of Siandra. Just like Sal, Idrissa Sek, who's 60, served as Wada's prime minister in the 2000s, but his subsequent bids for the presidency have been unsuccessful. He's one of Sal's main challenges, but a widely cited survey in November showed him trailing the incumbent. Osman Sonko is the youngest contestant in the race and a newcomer to the political scene with 15% support reported from last year's survey. When you are lucky enough to be inside the hearts of the Senegalese, you do not need to spend a lot of money to mobilize them. Everywhere we went, people came out in massive numbers. The 55-year-old's relative youthfulness could play to his advantage. In Senegal, more than 60% of the population is under 25 and probably anxious for change. We need him. He's the Senegalese we need today to change this system, to stand against the current system. We have wanted to evolve for years. Here's the Thomas Sankara you see here. He is the Cheikh Antu Diop. It's Blaise Diagne. It's Qaddafi, you see here. We are proud of him today. 63-year-old IT professor Issa Sal represents the party of Unity and Assembly. And as founder of a private university in Dakar, Issa Sal launched his political career in the late 1990s. Then there's Madike Nyang, aged 66, seen as having the least chance of winning the upcoming presidential vote. Beryl Oro, CGTN. We're going to a short break now. Don't go away. Lots more to come, including... An explosion in the Egyptian capital kills two policemen in pursuit of a militant. And how a music festival in Eastern DRC is helping to drive the peace agenda in the country. How will your world change today? What happens here? What happens there? Or what you make happen for yourself? If it matters to you, it matters to us too. Your stories are the stories that need to be told. Africa Live. Find your voice. Africa Live. Find your voice. To Egypt now, where an attempted attack by militants has left two policemen dead in the capital, Cairo. Three civilians were also wounded when an explosive device exploded following the arrest of a suspect. According to the Interior Ministry, security forces were pursuing a perpetrator of an attempted attack against the police patrol in western Cairo. Upon arresting the suspect, one of the explosive devices in his possession exploded. It was immense, and our homes are old. 
We were shaken inside and we screamed. The sound of the explosion was unbelievable. Our home is old and we jumped up and down. We screamed and we ran out with the neighbors. We didn't know if we should run upstairs or downstairs. We asked what was happening and then we went to the street and found people running. They were pulling people out and I found a body in front of me, blood and everything. The militant is believed to be a stranger in the area. Two days ago, he was riding a bicycle and wearing a mask and headphones. He did not look like a terrorist. When the attack happened, Captain Mahmoud was dead and the attacker was in pieces. The attempted attack left two policemen dead. Three civilians were also wounded, including a Thai student. Egyptian security forces have been waging a campaign against Islamist militants focused on Egypt's Sinai region. Brian Toussaint, CGTN. Well, for more on this, Adel El Marouhi is joining us now live from uh, Cairo. Adel, this latest incident happened in the heart of the Egyptian capital. What have investigations revealed so far? The identity of the perpetrator, um, his name is Al Hassan Abdullah Al Iraqi, um, has been revealed uh, by um, the Interior Ministry. Um, they believe the young man um, was behind uh, Friday's um, bomb attack. There was a planted a bomb, an improvised explosive devices was planted near a mosque in um, Giza city, which is part of Greater Cairo, on Friday. Um, luckily, the authorities have found and managed to defuse the bomb before it um, targets a further um, civilians. On Monday night, after receiving the location of uh, the perpetrator himself, um, the police forces rushed um, to arrest him, and as soon as they um, captured him, he had a backpack with, obviously, a, um, afterwards it was apparent that it was an, a, an, another bomb on his back, and he detonated it, killing himself and three other policemen um, during then. He was previously held in Egyptian uh, prison for about one year under provisional detention um, for being a suspect in a criminal um, case. However, he has been released afterwards, um, due to the lack of evidence and also he did not have any criminal record uh, before and therefore they have let him go. Uh, but now as they have um, um, allocated his uh, place, the security is investigated. They went into the apartment in Darb al-Ahmar area. They found um, several um, material, explosive materials uh, in his apartment, which also indicated that this place was a lab for his improvised explosive devices that has taken place in the past and uh, when he was captured on Monday night. So as you were saying there, then they found a lab with all of this stuff. A lot of firearms or explosives seem to have fallen into the wrong hands in Egypt. What is the government doing to address this security challenge? The government is actually um, launching um, numerous and uh, heavyweight military and police security campaigns nationwide. Um, the threat is can come from any person who looks civilian. This is the exact um, case with the um, with Al Hassan when he was uh, found and his location uh, was uh, revealed. He, he rented an apartment in a very populous uh, neighborhood in Old Cairo um, to just dodge the suspicions. And it turned out this is a, a, an explosive lab in the middle of these residential areas. So it gives you an indication of how these extremist ideologies are now um, evolving to diffuse themselves among the public and therefore monitoring them and reaching them would be quite hard and when it happens as we've seen on Monday night it becomes quite impossible for them to be arrested without falling uh, or call, inflicting any casualties. Um, just this morning, um, the Interior Ministry said it has killed 16 um, terrorists uh, in North Sinai, part of its security um, surveillance and um, the screening areas um, that both the army and police are um, holding. And it is part of a nationwide campaign to eradicate extremist groups specifically from North Sinai, but from the rest of the country as well. So it, it seems that Egypt is doing a huge effort in that regard, but it doesn't seem enough uh, for um, as they are not just fighting 
known individuals with known locations and it's sort of a, a declared war but it's more of an underground war that is taking place in the middle of the cities and therefore it is quite impossible to terminate completely as long as this ideology the extremist and puritanical translations of Islam uh, persist. Okay, thank you very much for that update. That was Adel El Marouhi there in Cairo. Moving on to other news, Zimbabwean President Emerson Amangagwa has reassigned four army generals to the diplomatic service. This follows a shakeup in the security sector following allegations of misconduct and abuse during a recent crackdown on anti-government protests. Among the four generals who've been retired is Major General Anslam Sanyatwe, who commanded the army's response to post-election protests that resulted in six deaths on August 1st, 2018. An independent inquiry into those protests found that the army used disproportionate force that caused the fatalities. He and three other generals are due to be posted to diplomatic missions, which will be announced once bilateral consultations are concluded, according to a statement released Monday. The unexpected changes are seen as a response to mounting international pressure to act on allegations of brutality against the army whilst quelling anti-government protests last month and a move by President Emerson Mnangagwa to consolidate his control of the influential military. The shake-up coincides with the absence of the former army commander, now Vice President Constantino Chiwenga, who led the operation that elevated Emerson Mnangagwa to the presidency. He's currently out of the country undergoing treatment. Farang Makutuya, CGTN, Harare, Zimbabwe. The Ministry of Antiquities in Egypt has been reopening several sites in the last couple of years. They were closed down due to poor security following the Egyptian Revolution of 2011. Here's Yasser Hakim with the details. This week saw the reopening of a pharaonic site in Minya, south of Cairo. The Bani Hassan site is a series of tombs from the 16th dynasty of Upper Egypt. The tomb area is where the rulers of the 11th and the 12th ruling family of the dynasty were buried. Some of the workers who constructed the tombs are also buried here. The tomb is the latest in a number of sites that have been reopened recently, such as Malawi Museum. The museum was looted and 50 of its statues were destroyed after the 2011 uprising. The revolution when it started in Egypt, January 25th, 2011, almost everything stopped in the Ministry of Antiquities. The main source of the income, those are the tourists. The tickets that they pay in our sites, this is the income that we use for constructing our museums. This is the amount of money that we use for excavations, for consolidations, for restoration, for all of our work. Once the revolution started, everything almost stopped. The restoration of security and stability in the last two years has enabled the government to showcase more of its ancient treasures. This is a good opportunity for the visitors to witness the beauty of our civilization and the lovely natural scenery around us. It's obviously clear that the security situation is at its best at the moment and there is no more concern to mention. Our guests will then go back home, post pictures of their trip on social media for all to see. And more museums are expected to be opened in 2019. What we are planning to continue in 2019 are other museums. I believe more than six or seven museums. One of them is Sharm el Sheikh, one Gurgada Museum, also Museum in Talba, in Kafr el Sheikh. We have a lot, that's what we do. And for the gem, the Grand Egyptian Museum, that was stopped for quite a long time after the revolution. We started again in 2016, and we believe that by the end of this year, 2019, will be finished as constructions. Tourism is a major source of hard currency revenue for the government. In 2018, it had witnessed a 55% increase year on year. The government says the reopening of several sites would help increase the number of visitors to the country and support the rejuvenated tourism industry. Yats Hakim for CGTN, Cairo.
In Niamey, in the Nigerian capital, 33-year-old Kada Kanye Ye has launched an elite African development university that is home to more than 175 students. After earning an MBA at the prestigious Harvard University, he returned home in an effort to share the knowledge and skills that he'd acquired. Situated in the Francophone neighborhood of New El Dorado in Naime is the African Development University. ADU, African Development University. The African Development University is a liberal arts university inspired by the American model through which we have added business and science in the context of our African values. You have university content like Harvard, Oxford, Beijing, the best content we can collect and you also have modules whose purpose is to understand Africa, understand our history. The main courses offered at ADU are communication, leadership, entrepreneurship and economics, but based on African traditions and values. For me, Africa Development University is a different university because it offers students many more opportunities. We are developing all the skills we need in the professional world. My English has improved a lot. I learned self-control. I also learned about community life. My dream is to become a lawyer. Tomorrow I would like to become a great manager and English is the most important thing in the business world. In addition, what I like when you come here is that there's a spirit of conviviality. You feel part of the family. 70% of the students have scholarships and come from many parts of Africa and language barrier had to be tackled. Yeah, we took three months before the academic year started. We started teaching them English and so far now they are able to have a, a class in English. They understand, they can ask questions, they, have, they can have a discussion. For the president of the Network for Education Sector Organizations in Niger, the African Development University is an initiative to be encouraged. The opening of this school is welcomed, especially as it promotes the quality and accessible education to all sons of Niger. That's why we think the government must make arrangements so that this school can work better. Keda Kane is scheduled to hold his first TED talk on technology, entertainment and design in Niger. His goal is to awaken consciousness through the sharing of testimonies and participate in the emergence of African success models. Beryl Oro, CGTN. Well, we're going to a short break now. We've got all the business news coming up, including... Tanzania loses $96.6 million a year due to drought. And delayed elections cost Nigeria an estimated $1.5 billion so far. Africa is the nexus of enterprise, and global business will tell you why it matters. From the mega investment projects to multi-billion dollar mergers and acquisitions. Africa today collects, just in terms of revenues from taxes alone, $545 billion a year. If you take 10% of that and you devote it to the energy sector, problem solved. All this on Global Business, weekdays at this time on CGTN. Africa Live. Find your voice. According to the country synthesis report, Tanzania is losing a staggering $96.6 million a year due to drought affecting maize and legume yields. The country's total annual losses amount to 306,805 tons. Of that amount, maize accounts for just over 240,000 tons and legumes nearly 60,000 tons. The losses account for 1.65% of gross domestic product with 0.96% for maize and 0.69% for legumes. Experts say using tested and validated climate smart technologies can help address low productivity. Nigeria is counting the cost of the postponed presidential elections. The Independent Electoral Commission announced that the delay 
well, it announced the, uh, sorry, it announced the delay just hours before polls, citing problems in the distribution of ballot papers and results sheets, as well as sabotage after three fires at its offices in two weeks. Businesses and schools closed as the country went into election mode. Millions were spent on preparing to feed voters and officials at polling stations. Another significant cost was transporting vast numbers of the 84 million registered voters across the country and from abroad to cast their ballots. The leading candidates, incumbent President Mohamedou Buhari and challenger Abu Bakr Atiku, have both called for calm. The effect of the postponement of the election on the economy has been very profound. Our estimation in the Lagos Chamber of Commerce and Industry is that the economy has lost an estimated 1.5 billion US dollars. It's an effect that cuts across all sectors of the economy. Whether you talk of, of the aviation sector, for instance, the traffic in and out of the country has reduced drastically. The maritime sector, because of the activities of the ports, cargoes coming in has dropped drastically. The financial services sector, Activities in the financial sector has also dropped drastically. Global gold mining company Anglo Gold Ashanti has put its Cerro Vanguardia mine in Argentina up for sale. This is the second mine that has been put up for sale with the Sadiola mine in Mali also on the selling block. The company has appointed a new CEO, Kelvin Dushnitsky, in efforts to change the portfolio. According to him, Cerro Vanguardia remains a profitable asset but holds no option to build critical mass around its new strategy. The mine has been in the Anglo Gold portfolio for two decades. A significant gas discovery by French energy giant Total is expected to be a game changer for South Africa's lucrative oil industry and stagnant economy. The find represents around a billion barrels of oil and is located about 175 kilometers off the southern Cape Coast of South Africa. CGTN's Angelo Coppola tells us more. The find and its prospects are a much needed boost for South Africa considering the current stagnant economy. South Africa is a net importer, significant net importer of oil and gas. We're looking at about $20 billion which South Africa spends to import oil and gas products in a year. So, of course, having indigenous South African resources to be able to fuel the South African economy is great news. The country's legislators have made a start to enable development of the oil and gas sector. Especially when you're looking at local content laws, we do think that South Africa needs to do more to be able to enable the environment for service companies to actually use the whole value chain of the oil and gas uh, industry to benefit the common man in South Africa. But not everyone's excited about the find, and that's based on the 2018 Intergovernmental Report on Climate Change released in 2018, which suggests that the world had until 2030 to act on climate change. That means that we have to shift urgently away from fossil fuels. If we're doing that, we shouldn't be exploring for any new fossil fuels anywhere. We should be focusing on shifting away from the fossil fuels that we use currently. We believe that the risks associated with Total's find far outweigh any potential benefits. Regardless of the potential climate change concerns, industry players want government to do more. So what the government needs to do is certainly to simplify the regulation for the oil and gas sector to make sure that we have as many companies as possible coming in with the right kind of technology to drill and give South Africa the energy resources which it needs. While everyone's excited about the find, it's going to be between five and ten years before there's any kind of flow of either gas or oil. I'm Angelo Coppola for CGTN in Johannesburg, South Africa. Well, staying in South Africa, the Reserve Bank is preparing a process of regulation for the country's cryptocurrency market. It's issued a consultative policy paper focused on the risks and the benefits of cryptocurrencies in South Africa. CGTN Sumitra Naidu now reports. The crypto revolution has taken the global financial market by storm, but some are getting rich while others are losing money. South Africa is now looking at how it can protect the market and consumers. The one fundamental regulation that you're going to see there is that uh, it should be seen as not a currency, but it should be allowed 
to work as if it were a currency. One other regulation is that these people must be registered. So the anonymity which is associated with crypto assets is going to be broken. On that side, I think it's good. We should all welcome. But the excessive nature of the regulation does worry me. Most crypto service providers and traders have enjoyed operating unregulated in South Africa thus far. But the Reserve Bank is looking to get some regulation in place by the end of the first quarter of 2019. It is clear that the authorities want to regulate it much more tighter over time and a total ban may be possible or at least an attempt to totally ban these so-called crypto assets as well is also something that could be considered over time. Cryptocurrency exchange service provider Luno operates in over 40 countries. They set up shop in South Africa in 2013 and currently have 2.4 million users globally. Regulators around the world have been fairly slow to, to form the opinions around cryptocurrency, specifically regulations, and that basically made banks around the world the de facto regulators, which made it very difficult for cryptocurrency service providers like Luno, like exchanges, to open bank accounts. The Reserve Bank's proposal is not to regulate cryptocurrency like Bitcoin itself, it's to regulate service providers. And I think that's a very positive move um, as it will provide consumers um, and potential future consumers with the confidence that um, the service providers who they are dealing with will be able to define regulatory standards. But some believe this is an attempt to have control over the crypto market. As the name suggests, digital currencies are produced by computers, therefore they are not owned or managed by government or countries. We have a very strong um, financial markets and very strong financial institutions. We are absolutely ideally positioned uh, to encourage the world's brightest people to use South Africa to develop this e technology even further. But instead of doing that, I'm afraid we've got Big Brother, and Big Brother is going to strive for this new technology. Public comment on the regulations closed Friday. The Reserve Bank is hoping to implement the new rules in the next few months. Sumit Ranadu, CGT and Johannesburg, South Africa. Well, we are going to a short break now. Don't go away. Lots more to come, including... Charity event in the Egyptian capital showcases talents of people with special needs. Africa Live. Find your voice. To Egypt now, and the country has hosted a gala night organized by the UAE's Al Rashid Foundation, showcasing talents of people with special needs. China has also been participating in the event. Yasser Hakim has more. The gala night called Emirati Day has been dedicated to fundraising for the special needs organizations. An art and photography exhibition has been inaugurated during the celebration. It includes paintings by people with special needs from many countries. This is an excellent forum, and I'm proud to be here in Egypt, the country of culture, art, and civilization. The UAE has always been sponsoring charity work for special needs and other segments of the society, too. And to be honest, the special needs have excelled in all fields, cultural, scientific, and artistic. The exhibition included oil paintings and photographs from different countries. Artwork by talented children and adults with special needs was on display. And China has been present in the exhibition through the works of talented painter Xin Bai Lan, who's had individual exhibitions in 50 countries. I'm really glad to be here. I came to Egypt 18 years ago, and this is my second time. I would like to use the opportunity to make new friends again and to meet the old friends from 18 years back. A short movie was screened for the guests. It was produced and starred by actors with special needs. <laughs> This is a very important event because no one used to see their work and it gives them the opportunity to improve themselves every year, especially when it's an international audience and artists are coming from places like China and Kuwait. The guests were also entertained by an orchestral performance 
from Egypt, playing popular classical Arabic music and songs. It is the first time to attend such an event in Egypt. There are oil paintings, photographs, and drawing by children with special needs. The Chinese artist has beautiful pieces, and the children, although they have special needs, they are more talented than others. The artwork on display is proof that dedication, hard work, and talent can produce wonders, regardless of the physical condition. The gala night was organized by Our Kids NGO and Ar Rashid Foundation for Special Needs. The success of this event has prompted both sides to repeat it every year to give more opportunities for the talented people with special needs. Yes, Hakim for CGTN, Cairo. To Kenya now, where hundreds of Chinese nationals in Nairobi were treated to a performance by top Chinese artists during a gala to mark the Chinese New Year. CGTN's at Wikista Niabwa has that story. The song and dance in Nairobi's Kenyatta International Convention Center conveyed the joy of the Spring Festival, the beginning of the Chinese year. This year, the Chinese State Council sent top-level performers to Nairobi to take part in the overseas Spring Festival festivities. This uh, performance came to Kenya three times already, in 2011, 2016 and this year. I think uh, they will come uh, in the future. Their performances evoked nostalgia among the Chinese nationals working and living in Nairobi. It reminded them of previous years when they celebrated the Chinese New Year at home. Um, my parents saw um, that the most famous singer came to Kenya and they wanted me to, you know, get an experience of the Chinese culture because I was born in Kenya and they wanted me to, you know, have a feel of the Chinese culture, how people celebrate the Chinese New Year. And I believe it was great. It was a great experience. A section of Kenyans also joined their Chinese friends. This spring festival celebration was a chance not just to mark the beginning of a new year, but also to share their culture with friends in their new home. I just wanted to learn more about the Chinese culture, uh, about the uh, festival, festival of spring, like how they just do their things, because uh, uh, we have some uh, mutual relationship between Kenya and China. The Chinese embassy estimates that there are over 130,000 Kenyans working in Chinese companies today. And on Sunday evening, together with their Chinese counterparts, they mingled and danced with the joy of the Lunar New Year. Bulkisanyabwa, CGTN, Nairobi. Well, the Chinese community in Zimbabwe have also held commemorations to mark the end of the Year of the Dog while planning for the New Year of the Pig. The community gathered to hold a lantern festival in the capital, Harare. The Year of the Dog has come to an end, and the Chinese community all over the world have been reflecting on the past year. At a lantern festival held in Zimbabwe's capital, Harare, around 200 people from China and Zimbabwe shared memories and wished each other great fortune for the coming new year. This function is an overseas culture event organized by the Chinese community in Zimbabwe. We celebrate the achievements in the past year, then we also foresee the future and we plan for the future. Very, this, so this is a very important occasion. Uh, we all wish each other that in the coming new year, uh, we pro wish each other prosperity, uh, peace and uh, prosperity. The Lantern Festival marks the final day of the traditional Chinese New Year celebrations. From ancient times, lighting of paper lanterns characterized celebrations and an opportunity to reflect on the year past and hopes for the year ahead. Beryl Oro, CGTN. Well, we are going to a short break now. We've got all the sports news coming up, including... South Africa's Casta Semenya challenges new athletics eligibility rules at the Court of Arbitration for sport. Africa Live. Find your voice.
A landmark case has begun at the Court of Arbitration for Sport involving South Africa's two-time Olympic 800-metre champion Casta Semenya and the World Athletics governing body, the IAAF. Casta Semenya, also the 800-metre world champion, was in court for the first day of a hearing of the case in Lausanne on Monday. The 28-year-old is looking to overturn eligibility rules for hyperandrogenic athletes.